by the way, the very upper estimates that they have in the New York Times article of over 4 million deaths, um, I think those are on the pessimistic side. Um, you, so for me, I would feel that that's really is a worst case scenario. I'm not sure exactly where they come from, but I'm also not going to say they're impossible. So you had something like 40,000 extra deaths occurring in a 71 day period over and above what you expect. And that suggests that there's huge undercounting of COVID deaths going on in Gujarat. So I want to begin by asking you very simply, how do you, uh, how do you, how does your model work and what criteria do you use to arrive at the numbers that you uh, spoken about. So when it comes to trying to estimate the scale of debt undercounting, I think it's a very complex problem. I think that there isn't any one method that you can use. So what I think is sensible is where you have good data, where you have data of higher integrity. For example, if you have cities which release excess mortality data, all-cause mortality data, or if this is obtained by, by news organizations, as was done in Gujarat, then what you can try to do is you can try to find out, you can try to ask, based on this data, what are the fatality rates that are occurring in these parts of the country, in those places? And then you can try to ask, based on that, if you have similar fatality rates occurring across the country, then what number of deaths would you expect? So in a sense, it's trying to use those areas where you have good data and not extrapolate directly, um, because you can't just say, for example, undercounting was, there was undercounting by a factor of two there, so it must be by a factor of two throughout the country. I think that's the wrong approach. I think what you say is, okay, so what did this say about the fatality rate from COVID, as far as we can tell there? And if that was the case across the country, what number of deaths would we expect? And when you do calculations like that, you still get a very wide range of possible answers, but at least you've got some sense of the scale at which deaths might be undercounted. Our COVID ground reports cost us about 7.5 lakh every month. You can help our reporting from the ground. Go to thequint.com, click support the Quint tab, choose a plan and pay. You specifically have a prediction uh, on the scheme or at which the deaths are being undercounted. Do you want to share that with us? Um, so in my kind of calculations that I've done so far, this is mostly based on 2020 data. I said that I believe that the scale lies somewhere between three and eight times. So that was my broad prediction. It's obviously, there's a big range there. So the true number of deaths that occurred uh, in 2020 were between three and eight times the total. If you were to press me on what I believe the actual number was in there, I would say probably somewhere in the middle, around five times the total. And that's based on using available data from Mumbai, available data internationally. And um, when it comes to what's happening in this wave, uh, we don't yet have a lot of real-time data, so we don't have a lot to work with, but um, I would suggest that things are at least as bad this year in terms of undercounting. Maybe some things have improved, testing might have improved, it might have reached some rural areas where it didn't reach before, but you've also got a surge which is on such a huge scale that it's very likely that deaths are being missed as well. So although I wouldn't really hazard a guess about the scale of missing deaths in this wave, I would say I don't think it's likely to be much lower than it was last year. So that my broad thing is three to eight times. Obviously, there's a big range there. Now, again, as we you spoke about this particular wave as well, there were a lot of deaths that happened outside the healthcare system because the healthcare system was overwhelmed. There were other reasons. Testing wasn't, uh, was limited, had reached its capacity all of those factors would actually indicate, like you just said, that the number would be much higher than what you predicted last year. In some places, at least, so say Mumbai, which I know much better, testing was much higher during this wave, this latest wave, than it was during the previous wave. So the total daily tests were going much more higher than they'd ever been in the city's um, previous epidemic. Um, on the other hand, when it comes to what's happening in rural areas, so for example, if you were to take rural UP or rural Bihar, I don't feel that I know well enough whether testing has improved, whether um, you know, testing teams are actually reaching these villages. But when you read local news reports, what you often find happens is that you have an epidemic, you have disease 
spreading through some villages, perhaps a cluster of villages um, nearby. You have a large number of deaths occurring. And then subsequently, a team from the district health office or some local team, medical team arrives, does some testing, some care is made available. So quite often, the testing and the medical attention is following after the event, after the actual epidemic has surged through. And from these reports, one thing that you get a very clear picture of is that very few of the deceased were actually tested before they died. So the chances of them making it into any official figures are very slim. Um, so I think you do have, uh, during this wave, one, a lot of avoidable deaths, a lot of preventable deaths because healthcare systems are overwhelmed. You do have a lot of disease spreading in areas where it's very unlikely to make it into official figures. And then of course, on top of that, you've got obfuscation. You've got what we've seen has been happening in Gujarat. You've got um, deaths which are probably actually of people who have tested positive in many cases, and they are still not making it into official COVID death figures because they are being classified as something else, as a death by comorbidities or something else. So you've got these different reasons, I think, why deaths are going missing from the figures. Can I ask you to elaborate uh, specifically on what you found in Gujarat, uh, where the death uh, difference, the missing deaths um, number was close to 40,000. Uh, could you elaborate a little bit on how you went about finding that number? So first of all, the data was obtained by Divya Bhaskar, um, who managed to get data on the number of death certificates which had been issued between the 1st of March and the 10th of May of this year. And then they did a comparison with last year, and they found that there was a big jump in the number of deaths. In fact, it more than doubled. But what we said, my co-author Ashish Gupta and myself, what we said was, OK, last year, there might be problems with the data. It was a national lockdown scenario. Maybe deaths were not being registered on time. So death registrations last year might have been lower for some reason. So maybe last year is not a good comparison. Let's go back a little bit further. So we went back and we looked at um, data both from the civil registration system and from the sample registration system. So both deaths which were registered officially and deaths which were estimated by sampling the population. And we said, based on these data, how many deaths would you expect to have occurred in this period in Gujarat, in a 71-day period, because that's what the Vyabas get covered. And what we found was that you would expect around 82 um, different approaches, put some slight variation on that, 80, 82, 84 maybe, but nothing above 90,000 deaths during that period. And what you, in fact, what Divya Bhaskar actually reported was around 124,000 deaths. So around 40,000 deaths more than you would have expected during the 71-day period. And this compares to 4,000 recorded COVID deaths. So I wouldn't jump in and say that all of those 40,000 additional deaths were COVID deaths. We don't know that for a fact. We just don't have the kind of data which confirms that. But my guess would be that a large part of those extra deaths, those excess deaths, were in fact COVID deaths. And that suggests that there's huge undercounting of COVID deaths going on in Gujarat. The Chief Minister of Jharkhand has said that the government wants to, wants to, you know, look at the data seriously, wants to go back and calculate the number of uh, dead to be able to make uh, realistic uh, policies. And it's a welcome statement, but, uh, you know, given political will, how can the government's states and center now go about rectifying the data, knowing what we know now, that we are knowing how terribly the, de the data has been messed around with. If, if there's political will, how does uh, the Chief Minister of Jharkhand go around uh, fixing that data? Uh, well, I think that's excellent. You know, when you have a Chief Minister who says, well, we actually want to genuinely, honestly map the impact. And I think that there are many ways that they could go about doing that. So first, I'm not really a demographer, so I don't feel very expert on the methodologies, but you would need to do a survey. And if it's within one particular state, then you do a statewide survey, which tries to cover rural areas and urban areas um, and give them the correct weighting according to you know, the demographics of that state, according to where the population resides. And um, very similar to other mortality surveys, you ask people about, did a death occur in the family? Ideally, you ask a little bit more. You try to find out what were the circumstances of the death, whether there were symptoms of some kind, 
Um, and later on, you can try to piece that information together to get a sense of the extent of COVID mortality. So mortality surveying is something which I think would be a crucial thing that state governments could do if they are genuinely willing and keen to understand the impact of the pandemic on the state. Uh, so what I do want to ask is now, I'm sure the purpose of that story and the purpose of what a lot of monitors do is to, is to give scenarios of what can be, what is and what has been. Right. Yeah. And uh, it's important to, you know, when, when someone says that, you know, the realistic uh, or the worst case scenario in India currently could be 4.2 million deaths. It's, it's a very, very disturbing number to look at. And uh, so it's important for us to clarify to people who are listening in why this is important. Why is it that we do these models? Why do we do these predictive uh, models that indicate what the real figure could be and why they're so important for policy making? So, by the way, the very upper estimates that they have in the New York Times article of over 4 million deaths, um, I think those are on the pessimistic side. Um, you, so for me, I would feel that that's really is a worst case scenario. I'm not sure exactly where they come from, but I'm also not going to say they're impossible because the data we have is so poor in many ways at the moment that it would be foolish to rule out that you've had that many deaths. But I do feel that's a very pessimistic estimate. Now, why do you want to give your honest best guess about the number of deaths which have occurred? Because I think it does two things. One, it helps you to try to understand what might happen next. So to forecast, to prepare, to, um, to, to kind of map what's happened and to build a sense of what might happen next, whether that's through direct modeling in, math, in a mathematical sense, or whether it's through modeling in a more vague sense where you have kind of narrative models of what are the possible scenarios which could unfold, for example, with vaccination taking place as well. So there's that aspect of um, trying to make these uh, estimates, but there's another aspect, which is hopefully, if people are estimating, then hopefully it does spur state governments maybe even central government to say, okay, we need to properly map the impact of this pandemic, at least in terms of mortality. Otherwise, all these experts sitting around the world will be just speculating and bringing us into disrepute. So in a sense, hopefully it spurs at least some governments towards greater data transparency, greater data collection. And um, if, as you say, for example, the Jharkhand chief minister has said that they want to properly map the impact of the pandemic, that would be an example of precisely the kind of outcome that you would want to come from making estimates. Um, I haven't looked at Jharkhand very carefully, but um, it is a state where, for example, I've read some reports from villages of villages being very badly hit um, by COVID, very big epidemics. And it is also a state which we know has poor health infrastructure historically. So where you would need special interventions, a special survey of some kind to actually get a sense of the impact.